Good afternoon. My name is Amy Henley, and I am the Dean of the Nistler College of Business and Public Administration. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today at our first virtual Olufsen Ethics Symposium. The Olufsen Ethics Symposium was established through a generous contribution from a UND alumnus, Bob Olufsen, 16 years ago. His goal was to create a signature event for our college and the community on the platform of ethics education. This year, things are a little different, and due to the unprecedented times we are facing, we're pleased to be bringing you this event in a virtual environment. We wanted to continue these very important conversations on ethics and business while we maintain a safe and socially distanced environment. We are grateful for the support from SEI Investments, which has assisted us in expanding the reach of this symposium across campus and throughout the community. And we have grown this event to the prestigious level where it is today. This afternoon's discussion will kick off with an interactive presentation from Dr. Sean Valentine, followed by a keynote presentation by Chris Hilger on ethics in times of crisis. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Valentine, Professor of Management, Chester Fritz Distinguished Professor, and the Robert Page Endowed Professor of Leadership and Ethics at the Nestle College of Business and Public Administration. Dr. Valentine's work has appeared in many prestigious journals, such as Human Resource Management, Human Relations, Journal Business Ethics, Contemporary Accounting Research, and others. We are honored to have Dr. Valentine as a champion faculty member in the Nistler College and here to share this interactive presentation with us today. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Dean Henley. It's, uh, it's exciting to be here, a very uh, uh, neat event to be part of, and uh, I'm gonna be providing you guys uh, kind of an interactive experience. We're, I'm gonna talk a little bit about ethics and social responsibility. And uh, then I fit in different questions along the presentation so you guys can, can click on uh, different responses and we can do some polls and it should be kind of fun. So uh, that's kind of the plan. And uh, overall, the, 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 we're gonna talk about what the process of business ethics and social responsibility is. It's, a, it's a very much a managerial process. And it's really a multi-level commitment to organizational ethics. Uh, as you can see here, um, and a little bit uh, of a diagram there, but you've got basically what is like an onion. And I, I talked to my classes about this. Uh, you've got different levels of, of social responsibility and ethics. You've got the individual in the, minor, in the middle. That's kind of like the core of the onion. And you've got all these, these processes that envelop employees you know, group processes and organizational processes. So what companies have to do is they have to institutionalize ethical values and principles in ways that bring out the best in employees. So when you hear things like CSR, corporate social responsibility, people automatically think about uh, what the company does outside the organization, you know, through various philanthropic efforts. But the way you grow this, it's almost like growing a garden, right? You actually grow it from within. You have to build organizational ethics from within inside the organization and then slowly move your way out into the communities to actually make a difference in a philanthropic sense. So I wanted to kind of share that with you so you kind of see how it all, it all works really in, in practice. So you've got multiple levels working at any given time that managers have to oversee. You know, instilling positive organizational norms at the organizational level. Uh, institutionalizing positive values and principles. These affect groups, these affects individuals, and then the company can move forward and, developing, and develop some policy or some commitment to corporate social responsibility. So that's kind of what you're trying to do. Now, we all know, we've all worked, right? Many of you all have worked. Uh, this is not an easy process uh, because you know, we all know, probably a lot of you guys have experienced in the workplace lots of different ethical dilemmas, you know, lots of problems, lots of, lots of common things that organizations have to deal with. So right now in business, and it's been like this for a while, this isn't a, uh, a new theme in any, any way, shape, or form, but there's a lot of cynicism directed at business. So corporate social responsibility and generalized business ethics is a way to mitigate people's concerns about what businesses should be doing. You know, there's the realization that, you know, businesses don't always do the things that they need to do. 
And that happens because they're made up of people, and people are fallible. So this is an ongoing process, an ongoing managerial process for helping people learn uh, how to be more ethical on the job. And, and I'll share with you some things just here in a few minutes that will enable you to do that too, besides just focusing on corporate social responsibility. Uh, the research shows that a, a lot of stakeholders out there really, really care about social responsibility. Uh, in particular, uh, employees, right, who, who work in the organization, and managers in particular, are very concerned about organizational ethics. Because as managers, we have to deal with the outcomes. We have to, we have to be accountable for all the things that our people do and fail to do. So, so the employees really are, are, are highly invested in, in building a, an environment of social responsibility and generalized business ethics. Um, here we go. Right now we're going to get into our first poll. And let's see what you guys uh, come up with here. So uh, here's a poll. I'm, I'm going to ask you guys, which of the following ethical issues have you experienced at work? And you can click all that apply. There's like 10 of them up there uh, that cover a wide range of different ethical issues. And, and uh, you know, click your appropriate responses. And let's see how people measure up. Let's see what kind of things you guys have seen in your own experiences. But you got discrimination. You got any kind of harassment or bullying or abusing people uh, to misusing resources or um, you know, theft and fraud, all the way to bribery, uh, you know, breaking the, breaking the rules, these kinds of things. Wow. We've got some good responses here. Uh, let's see. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it looks like bullying in organizations is a pretty big one. Yep. Yeah, that's, yep. Uh, favoritism. Is, is, is scores really high. You guys have dealt with that, very common, you know. Some discrimination, harassment, yep, those are up there too. Uh, misuse of company resources, that's like number two or number three. So you we can see, I mean, kind of collectively see from everybody's responses, these are real problems, real issues, right? Uh, so managers have to take proactive steps to to, to, to deal with these situations in the workplace. So that's an interesting poll. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot for doing that. That's really uh, gives us some information uh, to kind of consider, you know, as we, as we move forward uh, with what we're going to talk about today. Now, um, a lot of this dovetails into the kind of research that I do, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, on this particular slide, but really organizations um, have to create a context, organizational context, that brings out the best in people. And you know, we could get in and talk theories and, and, and conceptual models and all these kinds of things. And I just kind of put, put a few things up there for you to consider. When companies are ethical, there's better learning, there's a lot uh, lower dissonance. If you guys are aware of what dissonance is, it's a, it's a bad feeling you have about something. Or there's usually a stronger psychological connection. People identify more readily with the firm the firm ends up offering a better work environment and there's a lot more pride too, a lot more cohesion in organizations. And see all these connections, these are like, uh, it's almost like connective tissue in the organization. You know, ha all these things have the ability to improve work attitudes, job satisfaction, organizational commitment, reduce turnover. So there are a lot of real big practical HR kinds of applications for, th for this kind of work for this kind of attention. And then finally, what we're ideally trying to do is we're trying to increase how people make ethical decisions on the jobs. You know, so, so recognizing ethical issues, making good judgments, uh, and behaving ethically. So that's ideally what you want to do. And if you look all the way down to the bottom of that slide, I've listed all these things, you know, values and codes and training and, you know, yada da, right? But go down to the end, a big component of that is corporate social responsibility. You know, it, Corporate social responsibility is considered integral to a company's ethical culture. And that kind of ties in what I just said earlier about growing it from within. You build a culture from within, and then it moves outside. And it enables you to do all those philanthropic things. It enables you to, to support communities. It enables you to take better care of your stakeholders. But you've got to plant the seed inside and water it and water and water and see the plant grow. 
So that's kind of kind of what I'm trying to kind of the I guess the metaphor, if you want to call it that, that I'm trying to present here. Now, what exactly is corporate social responsibility? I mean, what is it uh, exactly? This is just a basic definition. Uh, I talk about this in my ethics class. Uh, it's a responsibility to act beyond the legal and the economic. And we're going to talk about this in a model here in a second. It's going to make more sense. But to go beyond that and act ethically and contribute in some positive way to society. So there's, there's this kind of basic understanding or basic recognition that we have to take care of our basic responsibilities like money and follow the law. But then we, there are more discretionary kinds of things that we can do to, uh, to be more socially responsible. Now, the tough part about doing this, this all sounds really straightforward, but the tough part of it is think about how many stakeholders a company has. It's a lot, right? I mean, if you break it down and cut, you include all your employees, all your managers, all your customers, I mean, you're talking about a lot of people, right? So, uh, and this just shows you what this stakeholder, pers stakeholder perspective is. It's actually based on what's called stakeholder theory in, in academic terms. It means that organizations try to establish long-term relationships with their stakeholders in a way that is supportive and that the stakeholders, you know, there's a reciprocal obligation or a quid pro quo for the stakeholder to respond in kind. It makes sense. You take care of customers, you provide great products, customers want to buy your products, right? So it's, it's, it's a very straightforward kind of process. Same thing with your employees. But look at all these stakeholders up here, guys. I mean, that's a lot of, a lot of parties, and that's not even all of them. You've got to balance all this stuff. So you see, I mean, a lot of these, these, these relationships are, are developed based on expectations. Well, can you think about how expectations might, be, uh, might not be in sync? In other words, you know, different parties have different desires or different expectations big time right so so that can be a, a, a serious concern so in reality you know if you're defining it and talking about it doing it is actually very difficult it's actually a pretty pretty challenging endeavor now something else I wanted to show you guys too is something called the corporate social responsibility pyramid and this was developed back in the late 70s by a gentleman named Archie Carroll and he published it in one of our top management journals and it's been used as kind of a, a lens for understanding CSR for a long, long time. And, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's a good one to talk about because it's not overly complicated. And uh, it has all the stuff in it. It has all the right, it, 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 it rings all the right bells, has all the right bells and whistles. And what the pyramid is, is it, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but uh, it's a similar kind of a thing. You've got these levels of different responsibilities. Now, the difference between this and Maslow is that as you move up the, the diagram, you, obviously your more fundamental things are at the located at the bottom of this diagram, your legal and economic responsibilities. As you work your way up, things become much more discretionary, right? In other words, they're up to the company to try to decide and actually implement. So what does all this mean exactly? And, and I, I'm trying to give you guys a, a few definitions just to, so it makes sense. Economic responsibility is, is, is extremely important. It means companies will make money. They'll generate revenue, you know, because uh, without revenue, your company's not going to stay afloat. So if you don't take care of your economic angle in your organization, all this real fancy, very altruistic, philanthropic kinds of things you want to do, uh, you're not going to be able to do them because your business may not be around very long. You got to follow the law. You know, that's a given. And then ideally you want to, you want to venture into ethical responsibilities. You want to go beyond the legal codes maybe in your profession and start emphasizing ethics in your organization. So all that stuff we looked at just a couple of slides ago, all the values and principles and, you know, making sure you have good leaders in the organization, that's really embedded within this level of the CSR diagram. And then finally, probably the, uh, the most, uh, probably the most widely understood and most accepted form of CSR is all the outside stuff that you see companies do. That's the philanthropic things. You know, this is the, probably, probably the level that gets the most attention because that's where you go out into communities and actually work with stakeholders and actually benefit others outside of the firm, right? 
I mean, eventually the idea is to work outside and to make a difference in society, which is, which is a great thing. So really that's the highest form of expression that companies can really have when it comes to CSR is, is giving to others outside the organization uh, with not necessarily the thought that they would get the same in return all the time. Okay, but they're, they're enhancing those relationships. Now it's interesting, now that's one kind of a model. Another model that you probably have all heard about is something called the triple bottom line. This is where we get into sustainability. I'm not gonna talk about it too much, but sustainability is a reflection of CSR, right? Um, and it, it's usually t called the three-legged stool because it's like, it's, think about sitting on a stool with three legs of sustainability or the three E's of sustainability. And this includes, and these are gonna be very similar to what we just looked at. You got, look at that, number one, economic. That's like the basic level in the, in the hierarchy, the pyramid, right? You've got social, which is really social equity, usually social fairness, benefiting society in some way. And then finally, environmentalism, which could be more philanthropic too. It could be legally driven too. But you can see it's just a slightly different model that they use in sustainability, but it's all the same kind of attention and, and, and modeling and, and activities. It's just split up into different criteria. Okay, so let's get to our next poll. Let's see what, see what you guys uh, can tell us here. Um, and let's see, let me back up. There we go right there. Have you worked for a company that focuses on ethics and social responsibility? And if so, how did your company show this commitment? And you, know, you can see I've listed the four levels of the pyramid and then, and then three of the criteria in the, um, in the triple bottom line. So just kind of let's see what you guys come up with. I, I, this is, I'm really curious about this, what you guys have seen. What you guys have seen, uh, yeah, oh wow. Economic scoring pretty high, legal, ethical's way up there. That's not surprising. And philanthropic is, it's in the mix too. Social issues and environment, yeah, they're all, they're, it's, a healthy, it's a healthy dose of all of them. That's interesting, yeah. It looks like you guys work for a lot of ethical companies. That's what it boils down to. And some of these companies because this is like second in second place, some of these companies are very philanthropic. They're probably going out into communities and sponsoring marathons and, and, and you know, maybe we're doing food banks and all these things that actually help people, actually help the general public. That's really cool, yeah. So, so you guys have some experience. Yeah, I guess number one was, uh, was, the, uh, was the ethical. So that's, that's neat. Why do we do this? Why do we spend this kind of time on this? Just in a nutshell, to kind of, kind of wrap things up here. It's very pragmatic. I think there's no denying the fact that when you're responsible and ethical, you get a better reputation. Uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta use your power ethically or else it may be taken away, whether it's from society or by the government. Uh, it's ethical, right? Uh, responsibility to behave ethically and to contribute to society enhances all kind of ethical outcomes. And without getting into a lot of the jargon in the field, but things like you, you, you generate positive outcomes when you do the right thing. That's called a teleological utilitarianism kind of a norm, meaning you're looking at the results. You know, when you, when you help others, it's very much deontologically driven, which is a fancy word for it represents kind of a universal moral value. Right? So that's another thing you do. And then, it, you know, all these great things you do for others, well, that's virtue. You go back to Aristotle and talk about all the virtues that we, we should embody. Well, by participating vis-a-vis -a, -vis a company's activities, you're doing that. So you, you're working for a virtuous organization. So there's a lot of ethical reasons to do it. And there are a lot of strategic reasons too. You know, it creates value, it differentiates you from your competition. And you're probably going to be able to sell more. And as a matter of fact, that's my, my next point. Doing all this stuff, right, is it good for business? You know, and this is something that I think about because I teach these kinds of classes and do this kind of research. I can tell you uh, that it does. It does. In fact, it's called the virtuous circle. And the research shows that ethically and socially minded companies tend to make more money in the long run. Maybe not short run, but the long run they do and then vice versa. The more money they make, the more they invest in socially responsible causes. So this is called the virtuous circle. So indeed, it does help. 
And so what should companies do to kind of, kind of just some quick practical implications for, for uh, how to manage business ethics? Well, some of the things I talked about already, you know, having codes of conduct, having training, having good ethical leaders, hiring good leaders. A lot of this stuff is done in partnership with, with human resource professionals. You know, getting good people into your organization up front is very, very important, all right? So that's kind of the internal side. The external side, what about volunteering programs, sabbaticals, community outreach? This is all great stuff you can do externally in the organization. So once again, we're planting the seeds up front and then we're, we're growing what we need to grow and then we're using it to get out into the community, okay? You could do it several ways. You could do it uh, focusing on compliance. Some organizations focus heavily on compliance and rules and things like this. Problem with that is, is that, you know, compliance only, employees might think that it's okay to act a certain way if there's no rule against it, you know? And sometimes people think, oh, the company's just protecting itself, you know? Values is another way to do it. Focus on all the values, very aspirational. Problem is, if you only do that, Employees are more likely to think management's not serious. So, you know, these rules don't have any bite to them. They're just values. They don't really, they're not taking them seriously. So what do you do? What do you guys think? Last question. What do you guys think? What, which approach do you think's the best? Values, compliance, or both? See how these come out here. Oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> it's off the chart. It's a landslide. Yeah, that's right. You know, and, and, and there's technically no wrong answer here at all, but yeah, yeah, uh, both ended up, values was, you know, pretty good, but uh, yeah, the both really, really was good. So, and that's really what it boils down to. And that's kind of, kind of how I'll finish today, is that really focusing on values and compliance is what you want to do. You want to build values first, and then build some kind of compliance program. So uh, folks, I really enjoyed talking to you today and, 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 and kind of getting, getting our Olufsen um, you know, um, presentations going today. I really enjoyed it and uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Valentine, for your exceptional insights into the areas of corporate social responsibility and ethics. I'm sure our students got a lot of lessons from that. And as an org behavior person, I appreciate you bringing up Maslow into any conversation. So uh, great talk. Thank you so much. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce UND alumnus and friend Bob Olofsson, our generous benefactor whose strong beliefs in business ethics have brought us all together today. Let me share a little bit about Bob first. A native of Garter, North Dakota, Bob attended UND and first received a Bachelor of Science degree from the UND College of Arts and Sciences in 1971 with a major in mathematics. Then a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from the Nistler College of Business and Public Administration in 1972. Bob spent his entire career working at Secure and Financial in St. Paul, Minnesota. He was in the group life insurance sector and was the senior vice president of group insurance at the time of his retirement in 2012. Bob has remained involved with UND over the years, including service as a member of the COBPA Advisory Council. He has also supported the annual Olofsson Ethics Symposium today since its inception in 2005 and further has established the Robert M. Olofsson Endowment with the UND Foundation to support students and their educational endeavors. Please give a warm welcome to Bob. Thank you, Dean Henley, and hello, everyone. I'm Bob Olofsson. As a UND alumnus, I've been honored to sponsor and support the Olofsson Ethics Symposium since its inception in 2005. I'm so happy that you have joined us today. Let me begin with a quotation that I think connects well with the rationale for setting aside time to focus on ethics. This comes from Alan Simpson, who was perhaps best known as a three-term U.S. Senator representing Wyoming. He said, quote, 
If you have integrity, nothing else matters. And if you don't have integrity, nothing else matters." End quote. Dennis Elbert was Dean of the College of Business and Public Administration in 2005. In the spring of that year, he talked with me about his vision for an annual ethics symposium to provide a platform for students and the community to explore the importance of both personal and professional ethics. And he offered me the opportunity to support that vision. I was immediately drawn to the idea and we agreed to move forward with the first event taking place that fall. Why did the ethics symposium idea appeal to me? Well, some of you may recall the early years of the 2000s, and if you don't recall them, perhaps you have studied them. Then, as now, there were lots of examples of individuals behaving unethically or criminally. But there were also many big stories of companies failing because of unethical behavior. Some of these stories illustrated a lack of strong ethical leadership with leaders who ignored or tolerated bad behavior. Some stories involved unethical leaders who encouraged or even directed bad behavior. And I suspect that caught up in these situations were many people who intended to behave ethically and probably assumed that they always would, but who were influenced by those around them, justified ignoring their personal values and went along with behavior that they knew was wrong. I felt very fortunate that where I worked, I enjoyed an environment with ethical leaders and a culture of doing the right thing. But I knew that we all may face difficult issues. The ones that most require us to rely on and trust in our ethical values are those that involve shades of gray without clear black and white, absolutely wrong and absolutely right answers. And I think that we all can be influenced by others, including our work associates and leaders. And it is so important to be surrounded by people who think and act ethically. So these things were on my mind in 2005 and led me to say yes to Dean Elbert. I thought, wouldn't it be great if we can help students prepare for challenging situations they may face by taking some time to specifically focus on the importance of ethics and to gain ideas and insights from others with a variety of experiences. Early this year, as we began planning for this event, we agreed that a document published in 2019 provided an interesting starting point. The Business Roundtable is an organization representing the CEOs of many of America's largest companies. In August 2019, they released a new Statement on the Purpose of a Corporation, which they described as a modern standard for corporate responsibility. The CEOs who signed this statement committed to lead their companies for the benefit of all stakeholders, customers, employees, suppliers, communities, and shareholders, and to deliver value to all of them. This stated commitment can certainly lead to discussions of both philosophical and practical considerations, but also ethical considerations. And we liked it as a starting point for the symposium. At the time, we had no idea of the severe challenges that 2020 would present. But those challenges make the topic perhaps even more relevant and timely, as you will hear in today's keynote presentation. When we started discussing how we should select our keynote speaker, I volunteered that maybe we could find one close to home, because as I mentioned, I was grateful for the ethical culture and leadership where I had worked. So I suggested the CEO of my former employer, Securian Financial, as our speaker. Securian is headquartered in St. Paul, Minnesota, and its history goes back to 1880, 140 years ago, with the founding of a life insurance company in St. Paul. Today, Securian is a diversified financial services company offering insurance, investments, and retirement solutions that give families the confidence to focus on what's truly valuable 
banking memories with those who matter most. It is a Fortune 500 company with over $6 billion of annual revenue, $93 billion of assets under management, and 6,400 employees and representatives in the U.S. and Canada. With $1.3 trillion of life insurance in force, it is the eighth largest life insurer in the U.S. Chris Hilger is a graduate of Indiana University. I've known him since 2004, when he joined Securian as a member of senior management. Chris was named president in 2012, CEO in 2015, and chairman in 2017. He serves on the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, which serves a region that includes North Dakota. He is co-chair of the St. Paul Downtown Alliance, and is a member of the Executive Committee of the Minnesota Business Partnership. From my perspective, in addition to being a gifted business leader, Chris demonstrates a strong commitment to treating others with respect and dignity, to being open and transparent about decisions and actions, and to providing philanthropic and volunteer support along with thought leadership in the home communities of the company. I'm very happy to introduce Chris Hilger for our keynote address, Ethics in Times of Crisis. Welcome, Chris. Thank you for your kind introduction and invitation to be here, Bob. It is an honor to be part of today's symposium. I've had the uh, privilege of knowing Bob for a long time and his values-driven approach to leadership and commitment to excellence during his 40 years at Securian Financial remain an inspiration to all of us who were fortunate enough to work with him. Bob, I know firsthand the legacy you created at Securian Financial, and you have clearly done so at this great university too. Thanks for leading and living by example. When Bob asked me to speak at this year's symposium, I quickly accepted. How can you say no to Bob Olofsson? And I was really looking forward to visiting campus today, but then circumstances turned this into a virtual event. It wasn't the first time and it will likely not be the last time that COVID-19 has changed my plans. But I have gotten pretty comfortable doing Zoom meetings and presentations this year, and that's coming in handy today. As Bob mentioned, we didn't know what 2020 would bring when he asked me to be today's keynote speaker. But as this year has unfolded, it became clear to me that today was a great opportunity to talk about how important and how powerful living your life and conducting business in an ethical manner is during a time of crisis. The defining issue of 2020, of course, is the worst global pandemic we have seen in a century. Today, I will give you an inside look at how one company, Securian Financial, has been navigating this crisis and how the crisis management principles we adopted have informed our response to other challenges we have faced this year. First, let me set the stage about who Securian Financial is and what motivates us. Securian Financial is a mutual life insurance company founded in 1880, just about 15 years after the Civil War ended. Our values of trust, strength, integrity, and quality respect and community have been our North Star since our founding. These values and the sense of purpose they inspire have helped us not only grow dramatically over the years, but have also helped us navigate crises ranging from the Great Depression to two world wars and 9-11 to what we're experiencing today. By the way, our values-driven purpose to which I just alluded is to build secure tomorrows by doing the right thing today. This purpose is an important part of our identity at Securian Financial and provides further support for the important decisions we make every day and certainly during times of crisis. I believe that having strong values and a sense of purpose shaped by those values is a critical part of the preparations that help people and companies navigate crises. Our values and purpose at Securian Financial cultivate a consistent and ingrained commitment to ethical behavior. They set non-negotiable expectations for all members of our team, whether they are long tenured dedicated associates like Bob Olison was or new employees. And by consistently demonstrating our values and commitment to our purpose, they become part of who we are and certainly a familiar reference point to everyone on our team. I don't think anyone at Securian Financial has been surprised by how we are approaching this crisis, and we don't have to convince any of them why we are making the decisions we make. Our decisions during the crisis 
and we've had to make a lot of them, a lot of big and important ones, reflect what I believe it means to be an ethical company. And these decisions have seemed natural to us because they have been motivated by the values and purpose we've embraced since our founding. You know, I guess it's possible to wake up one day and say, hey, I'm gonna start conducting business in an ethical manner. But during a time of crisis, I don't wanna to have to learn what that means. I'd rather it be second nature. So we entered the crisis well positioned to work our way through it effectively. We had and still have a common understanding of our values and purpose, outstanding financial strength that has been built over decades and an amazing group of talented and dedicated employees. But even those strengths are no guarantee of success during a crisis. Let's go back to early March of this year. Seems like years ago and yesterday at the same time. The pandemic was just starting to cause broad anxiety in the US. It had already taken hold in other parts of the world, but it wasn't clear to many of us what was gonna happen here at home. In hindsight, we should have been much more concerned. By mid-March, we began to realize that we were facing a major challenge in the US and really around the world. And by the end of March or early April, the country was effectively locked down. By late March, only 5% of securing financials over 6,000 associates were working in the office, just those that had to be there to keep the lights on. The rest of us were being introduced to a mandatory work from home reality, figuring out how to conduct business on Zoom and managing the added complications of helping children with distance learning, bringing college students back home early, remember all of that, and caring for elderly family members and dealing with tons of personal anxiety. We were listening to frightening news reports about COVID-19's potential death toll and watching our economy go into a free fall. Businesses, schools, and other organizations were trying to figure out how to manage through this chaos. Many were just trying to figure out how to survive. And that uncertainty applied to Securian Financial too. You know, I never thought that our company wouldn't survive the pandemic, but I had to be honest with myself about the potential impact on us and our customers. After all, we were watching the worst pandemic in over 100 years unfold, and we're a life insurance company. So how are we going to manage through this crisis? I remember receiving a barrage of questions from many important stakeholders, our employees, board members, rating agencies, and government officials. Were we going to shut down our offices? How many pandemic-related death claims did we expect to pay? How were our investment perform performing? Were we going to eliminate jobs? Of course, our customers were very anxious too. They had lots of questions. What happens if I can't afford to pay my life insurance premiums? Should I cash out of my 401k account? Is Securian Financial even gonna be there to pay my claim? New questions were coming in every day and the people asking those questions wanted answers now. They were concerned and many of them were downright scared. So we needed a way to manage through the sheer volume of decisions we were gonna to have to make. There was no way we could run through the normal decision-making process and hierarchy. By early April, our executive team developed and began communicating a set of principles to guide everyone at Securian Financial on how we were going to make decisions during, the, uh, during this crisis. I remember a, a specific Zoom call in early April with our broader leadership team of 50 or so officers of the company. Our leadership team was feeling very anxious about how they should answer the many questions they were receiving from our customers, distribution partners, and members of the community. It was then that I shared with our company the principles we would rely on to guide us during this crisis. First, we're gonna take care of the people who count on us. And I'll talk a lot more about that in just a minute. Second, we are going to protect the financial strength of the company that is critical to our ability to fulfill the promises we have made to so many people. And third, we are going to prepare for the future. The COVID-19 crisis will eventually end, and we need to keep our heads up and prepare to not only survive, but thrive during and after the crisis. These three crisis management principles are simple and easily relatable to everyone at Securian Financial because they emerge from the values and purpose that are so deeply ingrained in our company. Furthermore, I told our leadership team that if they made decisions consistent with these three principles, I would not second guess them. I would have their back, even if their decisions didn't result in a great outcome. And then I and my entire executive team repeated these principles whenever we could, at subsequent meetings of our officers, in all company meetings, in one-on-one -on -one meetings. And when the decisions we made ended up not being the best, 
We didn't second guess the, set of the decision makers and we did back them up. But it's amazing how few bad decisions we've made so far. And I can't think of a single really bad one. There's one other thing I wanna point out about our crisis management principles. Think about what we are stressing as being important. The principles and the priorities that are guiding our decisions during the crisis. We are committed to taking care of the people who count on us, protecting our financial strength and preparing for the future. Note that there is no reference to prioritizing short-term profitability. Our crisis management principles are all about stepping forward to meet the challenges we are facing with a long-term view on how to live up to the expectations of our purpose. I could spend all afternoon talking about the many decisions we've been making during the pandemic and how they have been guided by the three crisis management principles we adopted. But since we have a limited amount of time, I'm going to share with you some of our decisions related to our first principle of taking care of the people who count on us, something I think that we can all easily relate to. Of course, when we at Secure and Financial talk about uh, the people who count on us, we start with our customers. The people who buy our products and services are not buying something tangible that can touch, feel, or, or use in a traditional sense. In fact, our customers hope they never have to use some of the solutions we provide but they are buying a promise that we will be there for them if and when they need us. Being there for our customers includes good communication. When the reality of the pandemic and related shutdown took hold, we sent out proactive communications uh, to our customers and distribution partners, assuring them of Securium Financial's financial strength and that we would indeed be there for them and their families. And we ramped up our customer service resources in no small feat considering that we had to do this at the same time we were transitioning most of our customer service staff to working from home. During crises, sometimes our customers have specific questions and sometimes they just need to hear a comforting voice. Regardless, we needed to make sure they could reach us. We also provided policyholders with leniency on insurance premium payments and granted hardship waivers to customers who needed to withdraw money from their retirement accounts to make ends meet. And we were there for our customers and our family when they needed us the most. We have provided timely payment of financial benefits to our customers, including an expected $150 million of additional death benefits due to COVID-19 this year alone. And there's gonna be more that we're gonna be able to do there in, in 2021 for sure. In the midst of personal tragedy, we take a lot of pride in how we can support our customers and their families. Taking care of people who count on us isn't limited to our customers, however. Protecting the well being of our employees has also been a top priority. And we need to do so while putting them in a place to succeed with their work and manage the personal demands we're all facing on some level. We quickly moved about 95% of our employees to a work from home arrangement by the third week of March. And we're still working from home today, about eight months running now. This new way of working required a huge mobilization by our enterprise technology team. We had to equip over a thousand employees to work from home who were previously not able to do so. We delivered and helped install over 500 new laptops, thousands of monitors and other technology to our employees' homes. And we did this in a matter of days. For the 5% of our employees who needed to continue coming into the office, we made a number of investments in our company workspaces to make them as safe as possible. And we provided these critical on-site employees free parking and meals in recognition of their personal sacrifice. In addition, very early on, we placed a priority on preserving the jobs of our employees. We've had no pandemic related layoffs, furloughs or pay freezes. And we're optimistic that we will be able to continue to honor this sense of commitment that we have to our employees. Secure and Financial also supported our employees with a number of specific pandemic related benefits, including extra flexibility for employees who need to juggle an increasingly complex reality in their work and personal lives, including an additional two weeks of paid leave for employees who need to take care of a family member who is ill with COVID-19 symptoms or care for children impacted by school and daycare closings. We're covering 100% of the costs of COVID-19 testing and treatment for employees in our health insurance plans. And we issued a $500 stipend to all employees so they could enhance their workspaces at home. We have spent millions of dollars to support the health, safety, and effectiveness of our employees, no matter where they work. And I'll mention this as a point of interest for students in today's audience. 
The reality of the pandemic took hold right when we were making final preparations to welcome our college summer interns. Some companies chose to cancel their summer intern programs for financial reasons or the reality that it is difficult to run an intern program virtually. But we felt it was important to honor our commitment to the 41 students who had already agreed to dedicate their summers to us. And it ended up being a great program, not like it would have been had we been able to welcome all of our interns to our corporate campus, but not bad considering, considering the circumstances. The last example of our principle of taking care of the people who count on us is the commitment we have to the people in our community. We know the disadvantaged nearly always suffer the most during a crisis, and it is our responsibility to help the communities where we live and work. Our support to the community included donating more than $1.5 million to local food banks and small businesses. We also donated 30,000 N95 masks to the Minnesota Nurses Association. If you think back to those early days of the pandemic, there was a great shortage of this type of personal protective equipment. And remember that I uh, mentioned to you that we had to equip a lot of our associates with laptops as we transitioned them to a work from home arrangement. Well, we also donated 100 new laptops to a local school as it began ramping up for distance learning this fall. I've shared with you a lot around our principle of taking care of the people who count on us, but our business is all about protecting people's future. So it shouldn't be a surprise that during times of crisis, what motivates us starts with taking care of the people who count on us. Nonetheless, we were soon to find that we are going to have another opportunity to test this principle. By the end of May, we had generally adjusted to working in crisis mode. We'd figured out how to successfully work from home and we'd gained greater insights into how the pandemic was likely to impact our customers and the financial performance of the company. Then tragedy struck on May 25th, when George Floyd was killed in our own backyard while in the custody of the Minneapolis Police Department. The phys physical and emotional aftermath was devastating for our community, our employees, and really the entire world. After hearing the pain in our community, I knew that we needed to do something if we expected anyone, including our employees, to take us and our values and purpose seriously. A few days after George, George Floyd was killed, I wrote to our employees that Securian Financial was committing to being part of the solution to social injustice. This was an important moment where we needed to make a stand that reflected our values. In that letter to our associates, I acknowledged the reality that George Floyd had been killed by those sworn to protect him. I also acknowledged the systemic racism in, that Black and other communities have faced for generations. And I committed to securing financial to being part of the solution to solving this injustice, starting with listening to one another and particularly listening to our neighbors who have been most directly impacted by society's failures. We shared this commitment publicly on social media and also signed on to similar statements by coalitions of Minnesota business leaders. This was a big deal for us. We don't make political statements as secure and financial. This wasn't a political statement, but we knew some people would perceive it that way. When you make a statement like we did, the follow through becomes really important. We quickly aligned on education being our way to help tackle such a big issue and have since focused our efforts on two parallel paths. Our first area of focus is educating our employees on social justice concepts to which they may not have been exposed or quite frankly, may have avoided because it was outside their comfort zone. Uh, this effort included holding 10 listening sessions in June for our employees so that they could share their reactions and learn from one another. Nearly one third of our employees attended one or more sessions and I, I attended a couple of them. They were very powerful and very helpful for me as I helped to understand more what was going on in our community. We published a series of self-education articles on our internet about social justice and race related topics. And we created monthly discussion groups focused on the book, So You Wanna Talk About Race by Ajoma Luau. Uh, it's, a more, it's an effort or a book club series that more than 400 employees have enrolled in it, and including me, we just had one of our book club meetings last week and uh, I really enjoyed it. It's a great topic and really super opportunity to share these ideas and, and uh, concepts with your fellow uh, uh, colleagues. If you're looking for a book to help form your own journey in this area, I highly recommend it. Again, it's So You Want to Talk About Race by Ajoma Oluau. Our second area of focus is supporting greater equity in the community by helping close the considerable education achievement gap between races in Minnesota. And so far, 
we've donated more than $500,000 to these types of causes. And we've begun to tackle some of the structural issues within our own organization and contribute to greater action in the broader business community. Our foundation has created new grant making requirements that set expectations for equity, inclusion, and social justice commitments from our partner organizations that receive funding from our foundation. And Securing Financial has aligned with the Twin Cities Corporate and Community Coalition of Government, Philanthropy, and Business Leaders to collaborate on policy and shift philanthropy to support corporate DNI efforts. All these actions are part of a larger corporate social responsibility program inspired by our values. In a minute, I'm going to share a video that demonstrates how Securing Financial's values and purpose have been on full display in 2020. You'll recognize some of these same points I've already made, but hopefully it paints a good summary picture of what it means to be a values and purpose-driven company during a time of crisis. Then I'm gonna come back on the other side of the video to answer your questions. But before I do, I'd like to leave you with this. The pandemic remains a daunting challenge. We are not through it yet. COVID-19 cases are at all time highs in the country right now, and particularly in our region. Securing Financial is still largely working from home and we will likely be doing so for some time to come. And when we do return to the office, we know it won't be the same as when we left. We also know that the economic impact of the pandemic is still mounting and we don't know exactly when or how it will end. And I accept the reality that Securing Financial's financial performance will be negatively impacted by this crisis. But I also know that at, at a time like this, it's when we get to live our purpose in a very obvious way. I know we'll be proud of how we serve those who count on us and we will emerge from the pandemic with outstanding financial strength and in a great position to help future generations prepare for their financial security. And social injustice, well, that issue has existed for longer than the 140 years that Securian Financial has been around. But the conversations do seem different this time. There's greater unity, focus, and determination to do the right thing. And I'm optimistic that positive change is coming our way. Both the pandemic and social injustice reality we face present big challenges, big challenges to us as individuals and big challenges to the organizations and communities we're part of. But I firmly believe that if the actions we take to respond to these challenges are motivated by our values and a commitment to an ethical way of engaging others, we will have an incredibly positive impact on those who count on us. And along the way, we'll discover that it's good for business too. Thank you for your interest and time today. And thank you, Bob, Dean Henley, and everyone at the university for the opportunity to join you. At Securian Financial, our values define who we are and how we do business every day. And our customers and distribution partners share these values. They tell us it's one of the reasons they choose to do business with us, because the decisions we make impact them and their families. Trust, strength, integrity, quality, respect, and community. They're more than just words. These values drive our actions. We serve the long-term interests of our customers, providing them with a sense of security and lasting value. We will be here when they need us. We maintain unquestioned financial strength. After all, we must be strong to provide security for others. We are committed to delivering on the promises we make and maintaining high standards of ethical conduct. We fulfill our clients' needs responsibly and efficiently with excellent products and service that stand the test of time. We treat people with dignity and value diversity. We are better together. Finally, we're good neighbors. We serve our community responsibly through philanthropy and volunteerism. These values support our purpose of helping our customers build secure tomorrows, no matter what the future brings. Our values have been our North Star in every crisis we faced through our 140 year history, from two world wars to 9-11 and the Great Depression to the Great Recession. Our values have put us in a natural position of strength to emerge stronger on the other side. A confluence of historic events put Securian Financial's values on full display in 2020. They informed our three principles for managing the COVID-19 pandemic take care of the people who count on us, including our customers, employees, and the communities where we live and work. Protect our financial strength because the promises we make to people depend on it. And lastly, prepare for the future to continue to thrive.
We also relied on our values as the world reacted to the tragic killing of George Floyd in our own backyard. We continue listening to diverse voices and publicly committed to being part of the solution to social injustice. Education is critical, so we are investing resources in informing our employees and supporting organizations committed to closing the achievement gap that holds back underrepresented populations in our communities. History has proven the disadvantaged nearly always suffer the most during crises. That's why we have expanded our giving by millions of dollars to lift up the community we've called home for so long. Ultimately, our values help us lead with our heads up and our hearts open. They've stood the test of time and make us stronger. And they will accelerate the achievement of our strategic aspiration to be the highest performing, purpose-driven financial services company. For 140 years, we've persevered by staying true to who we are. Our values and purpose will continue guiding us through the next 140 years. Wow, thank you so much, Chris, for an engaging and thought-provoking presentation. We are very grateful for the time you've shared with us and the insightful perspectives that you've shared about ethical responsibility, particularly during these uncertain times. We now want to spend a few minutes in the Q&A format to hear from our audience about what questions they may have for Chris. Please enter your question in the Q&A function, and we will do our best to address as many questions as time will allow. Let's get started. First question, Chris, what unexpected opportunities have you found during the recent operational changes? Well, well thank you. First of all, Dean, appreciate you inviting me uh, to participate in the symposium and uh, Bob Olison, thank you as well. Uh, Bob's a good friend of, of mine and the organization. We're glad to support this great, great event, event that we have. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of interesting opportunities that are coming out of, of um, the reality that we have, are working from home and we're working differently than we ever have. Uh, we are finding new and creative ways to connect with one another. We're finding that we can actually bring new talent into the organization uh, that we may have felt was, was out of reach in the past. Um, and I, I think it's just, just a, an a very powerful time to, to see the values and purpose of the organization resonate in a real obvious way. As I made uh, in my comments there, this is a challenging time, but it's also a great opportunity for us to put our sense of purpose and our values in full display and really rally around that as a, a, a way to get through this challenging time. Great. Do you suggest that a company has an ethical obligation to the employees to help them grow in their skill sets as they move forward in their careers and look for advancement? Uh, you know, I'm not sure that's a, a, an ethical responsibility of the company, but it's just smart. Um, <laughs> when, you, when you think about how, how hard it is to, to bring on the, the talent um, that, that you need as part of an organization, it's only smart to, to invest in, uh, in, your, in your employees. And we have a lot of uh, things that we do at Securian to make sure that we're giving these great development opportunities to our associates, uh, whether it's a, a, a new project, a volunteer opportunity, uh, any number of different ways that we can, um, can help them and the, them develop. And, and when our associates take advantage of that, we call them associates, by the way, so we <laughs> say associates versus employees, it's part of our lexicon, I think, but with a, <laughs> when our employees take advantage of those development opportunities, uh, there are always great advancement opportunities that come along with it. So part of it is being uh, a, a member of an organization that creates that rich development experience, and part of it is the individual initiative to do something with those development opportunities. Absolutely, that's a great point, that it's a, it's a reciprocity, right? That the employee and the organization need to share with one another to be the most successful they can be. What do you think of Mer yeah, I, Oh, please go ahead. Well, you, you just bring up a really good point there. Whenever I talk to our interns or new employees, um, I, I talk to them about their responsibility for taking the initiative to go out there to develop and find those opportunities to, to look for stretch assignments and, and to look for opportunities to hone skills that they might not feel are natural to them or aligned with their core strengths. 
it is about really owning your own personal development. Yeah, that's a great point, to step outside of our comfort zone, right, to, to grow. And particularly during times of change and uncertainty, we're going to be pushed outside of our comfort zone more than we probably would have ever imagined. What do you yeah. think emerges about an organization during times of change? What do you think are the, the key attributes that come out that indicate whether an organization will be successful or not? Because I, I like to think that during times of crisis or during times of uh, jubilance that the real nature of an individual comes out. So I would suggest probably that the same is true for an organization, right? So what do you think emerges uh, during these times of crisis? Well, um, I think you're right on. You know, during times of celebration, during times of crisis, um, I think we see how committed organizations and people are to their values and, and purpose. Um, I think there's a temptation when times get tough to, to think about, can I take a shortcut here? Can I take a shortcut there? Um, and, and, and smart organizations and committed individuals realize that those shortcuts do not pay off in the end. And, and quite frankly, it can do just the opposite. If you lean into to what's truly important to the organization, what you've proclaimed as being core to who you are and what motivates you, it can be an incredible source of strength. Uh, for the organization um, but hey tough times test people and organization in strange ways yeah and, uh, we believe it's a time to rise to the occasion sure absolutely how would you deal with an employee that was counter to the culture of the organization in such a way that uh, they felt an ethical superiority in, in a judgmental type of way how do you think organizations can respond to balance the employee framework with the organizational framework if they may be in, in conflict with one another? Well, I think most people are, are well-intentioned and, and good folks and, and uh, you know, it takes a, a conversation, it takes um, a, a real commitment to humility. Uh, you know, we, we all can get caught up with ourselves uh, over, over time and, and uh, you know, reminding ourselves that um, being a humble and, and being open and receptive and, and, and tolerant to the views of others uh, is is just is good for you as a business. It's also just a good way to live your life. Um, the 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 reality is is that on rare occasions uh, the fit is not there. And I think it's just as important for an organization or an individual to to, um, to look at it and realize, wait a minute, this isn't working. We need to to go separate ways and. Unfortunately, we do, uh, I think, a really good job of trying to make sure that we put on full display at our company what's important to us as we talk to people about joining our organization. And we haven't had uh, a lot of those situations where it's made sense to part ways, but it does happen periodically. Sure. And I think you have to have the courage, um, and, and even if there's short-term pain associated with it, to, to call it out and say, hey, this isn't working. But uh, that's the exception, not the norm. Yeah, that's a great point about having the courage. And oftentimes, unfortunately, being ethical does take more courage than not being so in, in some situations. What do you think students, I, I like your point about what you look for and the organization looks for when you're hiring. So if we're talking about students who are graduating with a degree in business and starting their first job of their career, what kind of things should they ask or look for to assess that potential fit from an ethical perspective? I think some of it, it's the kind of the more blocking and tackling research stuff that you can do uh, to, to get, what is what is the company publicly saying that's important to us? And there, you know, most companies can go to their websites, you can get literature on, uh, on look at press releases, all that kind of thing. You, and you can get a, a sense of, of what they say is important. And, and if that aligns with what your interests are, uh, that's a, a potential good opportunity for you. The, the tricky part is to find whether or not organizations are walking the talk, and uh, you know, are they are they are they living their values in in a way that's consistent with what they're saying is important. And um, you know, usually if you dig a little deeper, you can find examples or proof of an organization living those values and um, uh, uh, conducting business consistent with its pur purpose and values, and and find instances when they're not. And in all companies, uh, I looked at. Uh, Dr. Valentine's comment uh, about hey, companies are made up of people and, and people are fallible and, and companies and people make mistakes and we should acknowledge that, but um, you wanna be careful or organizations that are consistently making mistakes <laughs> that are not consistent with what they proclaim to be important. 
I think that's a key point that Dr. Valentine made uh, about organizations and, and then to reiterate your point, Chris, that we often talk about espoused values versus enacted values and espoused values are what an individual or an organization suggests that they believe in, but then their enacted values are what their actions tell you that they truly believe in and ideally those things match one another. The challenge becomes when there's a disconnect there and there's dissonance and, and individuals and employees can see that if they're working for a company that says they support one thing uh, but the budgetary and financial decision making they do suggests maybe they support something different. Well, so, you did just to kind of put it another way, I think people and organizations can fake it for a while, but they <laughs> can't fake it for a long time. And get away with it. That's great. Yeah, that's true. You know, I, I appreciated that you spoke about the current uh, societal concerns and the ethical obligations as you as an organization, uh, particularly when things happen that we don't anticipate to happen and are times of crises like the George Floyd case in, in the cities. And so how does your organization approach the proactive balance of budgeting, say, for charitable contributions, but also the reactive need when things happen immediately? Yeah, we, uh it, it is amazing. Every year there are uh, unforeseen foreseen needs in the community that you want to be able to support that are consistent with uh, the areas of interest of your employees and your organization. Um, this year has been a particularly challenging because there has, has been a huge need. Um, you know, some of those needs showed up very early in the year because COVID-19 became obvious in, in March and we were able to uh, really dedicate a lot of our philanthropic fo focus to some of the, the needs related to the, the pandemic. Um, and then the George Floyd tragedy came along and we had another opportunity to look at, at it and, and dedicate some resources there as well. Um, it, is, it is a real challenge because there is a limit any organization has to how much it can do in the community. I think we've done a pretty effective job of focusing um, our resources in where the critical needs of today are. Uh, and we have expanded the amount of giving um, that we're doing in the community. At the same time, we're, we're uh, having more financial pressure on the organization because uh, my, one of my comments in there, we're a life insurance company in the middle of a pandemic. Yes. So, um, but we're trying to live up to our values um, by, by uh, stretching to help the community, which really is suffering in a lot of ways uh, during this crisis. Um, I think that's what it means to, to live your values, at least one of the ways we do here at the Sterling Center. Yeah, that's true. There's there's countless areas that need support and are worthy of support and uh, charitable giving. So prioritizing those can always be difficult because uh, that means that things that are of great value sometimes will not get the support that others could just because of what there is to go around. Uh, one thing we've been talking about in higher education during the pandemic is the health of our students, the health of our employees, our faculty, our staff, and that many people are just kind of exhausted right now. And ethically, we have an obligation as leaders, we believe, to acknowledge that exhaustion and try to be proactive in helping individuals. Are there areas where Securin has done that, as, as noticed proactively, uh, the mental health of the employee right now? Yeah, uh, this is a real challenge. You know, we, we so much of the focus early on was on the COVID related, the direct COVID related health crisis that we were experiencing. And, and yet when you think about um, uh, other uh, challenges that come out of this crisis, they're real too. Uh, uh, the mental health related issues being a really important one that we're trying to address. And it's a challenge because you know, we're not coming together physically so where we can see and feel when people are hurting and, and we're trying to have to figure that out in a, in a virtual environment. But we're keenly aware of, of the need that's there. We're, we're, we're trying to provide a tremendous amount of flexibility. And one of the things I'm amazed with is um, the, the challenges and yet the dedication and creativity that I see with um, our employees who have young families and mm -hmm. uh, how it is it's, it's just a remarkable challenge, you know, trying to do their jobs, trying to do it in new ways, uh, and trying to take care of their, their children at the same time. And the same thing could be said of those that are taking care of their elderly parents. I mean, this is a real, real challenge. And so we have to be 
uh, sympathetic as an organization and, and not be one more obstacle for them, but be really a resource for them. That's kind of the approach that we've taken. And but it is it is really difficult because we're not across the table for, from our uh, our colleagues like we used to be, and we're sure. trying to figure this out and connect to the, with them and find where they need our help in new ways. Sure, that's true, and every individual is experiencing things differently right now and has different demands and different stressors uh, that they wouldn't have had. But it's interesting, as a, as a mother of a four-year-old boy who's at home quite a lot more than he had been originally, um, I know that it's stressful, but then I also think about the times I get with him that I would have never gotten in before the pandemic, you know, getting to have lunch with him on a, a random Wednesday. And so uh, there's gratitude for that, too. But the uh, the balancing act is hard for all of us right now and all of our employees. And I think ethically as organizations, us just acknowledging that is it probably goes a long way. Now, I think, I think also just also uh, making sure that, hey, we we had, um, by default, uh, assume good intentions and good effort, by the way. We got to cut each other some slack in this environment. And I think we've done a pretty good job of that as an organization. But that's one thing I always, I, 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 every meeting I have on Zoom, you don't get the sense <laughs> of, of, oh, how people's days are going. I'm assuming that uh, they're, they're giving their very best. And that's, that's a nice way to kind of set the table of expectations. Oh, I think that's a great point to assume that people are trying their best and doing the best they can in these environments. I know early on in the pandemic at the university, we had a lot of decisions and a lot of things to consider. And what gave me great comfort is that there were a lot of people working very hard all the time to figure those things out. And if we're all doing that, that's the best we can ask right now. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think it's helpful for our students to hear when successful leaders may have second thoughts about something they did or regret a decision that they made because all of our paths to leadership have been uh, difficult, at, I'm sure, at times and successful at other times. Is there a time that you faced an ethical dilemma that you would have done differently now looking back on it? You know, uh, certainly there are decisions that I've made in the, in the, uh, in the past that ended up not being good decisions. Um, I, you know, we have such a strong set of values in our organization that I don't think we step on a lot of landmines when it comes to ethical issues. Um, it, when, we, when we do run into those types of issues, they tend to be issues where we're trying to meet the expectations of, uh, of, of our external constituents or stakeholders. And, and quite frankly, one of the big challenges right now is we live in a country that's highly polarized. And so you have expectations uh, from one group of, of, of stakeholders that might be at complete odds with the, uh, the, the expectations of another set of stakeholders, and neither one of them is necessarily absolutely right or absolutely wrong. And how do you make a decision that's consistent with your values, consistent mm -hmm. with what you proclaim to be your purpose, and not alienate someone uh, they're, they're, and they tend to be a lot of these uh, political and social issues that we get drawn into more and more as an organization. You know, er, earlier in my career, um, there wasn't the expectation that a business would step into, way into issues that are outside of the normal classic business issues mm -hmm. um, like there does today. Today, the expectation is very high that uh, companies will uh, proclaim their position on all sorts of things, even mm -hmm. when they're not traditional business issues. And that is a real challenge because there's no way you can keep everyone happy. Um, and, and there's no, and in most cases I found it's not like somebody's absolutely right and somebody's yeah. absolutely wrong. Yeah, that's a great point. And thinking of Dr. Valentine's presentation about the ethical responsibility of an organization and the financial responsibility and the social and the legal responsibilities. And oftentimes there's very few of those responsibilities that can be defined as either or black and white on one end of the continuum or the other, there's often different pieces that will be right to some people and not to others and vice versa. So uh, I think that's a good point for our students who are graduating to consider that, you know, sometimes we don't know the answer and, and that may be okay. And sometimes the answer will disappoint others and other times it will disappoint a different group of people. And so the strive for perfection probably would get in the way of still making ethically appropriate decisions. So, 
Well, actually, one more, then we'll let you off the hook. <laughs> We've been pepper, peppering you with great questions. And I really liked this one from one of our students asked, with the constant flow of news information, so especially regarded COVID-19, the pandemic, it appears that the public eye, so to speak, finds a new subject to pay attention to two or three times a day. Do you think firms still feel the pressure to maintain their CSR even when they're in action or their negative actions could be forgotten in the matter of days, if not hours, with all of the news that's going around? Yeah, that is a good question. Uh, it is, um, it's, it's an interesting one because I, I do, I know we at Securian and I think businesses broadly uh, continue to feel pressure to, to not only maintain their commitments to corporate social responsibility, but to, to really grow that in, in more obvious ways. And that pressure comes from both, both external and internal sources. And, you know, the external sources are our customers and regulators and maybe people in our community. And, and we get a lot of pressure from, from them. Um, you know, we have a, a lot of individual customers. We have a lot of institutional clients and, and they have their own formal programs that, um, uh, that place expectations on uh, suppliers of theirs or uh, like us. Um, regulators are certainly are very, very interested in them. And, and, and that's a type of pressure that we get. But we also have some really um, important internal pressure that we receive. Um, uh, and, and it comes from, um, you know, our board of directors uh, who really set the tone. We have a great board and, and, and they uh, uh, have high expectation for our organization and they put that expectation front and center every day. Um, and we get a lot of pressure uh, good pressure from living up to the expectations of our values and purpose. And, you know, who doesn't want to be part of an organization that takes pride in doing the right thing? Uh, I don't think this pressure, both internal or external, is going away. And I actually think that's good. I think this, yeah. this, this is a situation where we should be committed to keeping the pressure up on ourselves and accepting the pressure that comes from outside. That's a great point, to keep the pressure up on ourselves and the organization, to have high standards for ourselves and what we expect of the organization. And as you say, it's nice where an organization expects themselves to do good. And that's a very lucky path for any of our students to go into as they start their careers. Wow, we are so thankful, Chris, for your valuable insights today and for joining us. I know we share an affinity and appreciation for Bob Olofsson, who allowed us all to be here today. and has been an incredible hallmark of our ethics symposium that he created. If you would like to continue these conversations, please stop by the networking lounge. You'll find a link in the chat box, and you can ask questions of Dr. Valentine, myself, Mr. Olofsson, and students, this is very important. If you're attending for a class, please enter your name and your course number in the chat box so you get credit for being here. Thank you again so much, Chris, and thank you everyone for being here for this first ever virtual Olofsson Symposium. Take care. Thanks for including me. Thanks, Chris.